Well, thank you so much, and thank all of you for spending time with us this afternoon. Um, I'm Jen Gregory. I'm the president of Downtown Strategies at Retail Strategies, and um, also super happy to have my friend and colleague and client, uh, Mayor Sally Garland from Crystal Springs to join us today. So um, just real quick, want to give you a little background of myself, of the mayor, and then we're just going to dive right in. Um, at our company retail strategies um, you know a lot of people hear that name and they think retail downtown oh you guys must recruit retail to downtowns no that's not at all what we do so uh, before we start this we do specialize in retail and we do focus highly on developing properties in a downtown area to be retail ready um, but we don't recruit retail to your downtown because that's a super specific and grassroots effort as all of you know as Main Street Director. So what we're going to talk about today is really how to get your communities ready uh, for retail and actually what are the steps to recruiting retail and restaurants to your downtown because there is a formula um, there is a method and from my time as a Main Street director um, I learned that a lot of times that's not talked about in the Main Street world so really happy that we're all here together um, to talk about that also Mayor Sal Sally Garland um, really, really gets it as a mayor. So I'm so excited that she's here to talk with us today as well. When she became mayor, she focused immediately on beautification. You know, um, and the first time that I drove through downtown Crystal Springs, I thought, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. This is kind of your quintessential historic downtown. And so that element is so important. Um, and, you know, as we talk about Crystal Springs kind of as a case study, I really think it's important to mention that, you know, obviously Crystal Springs is a Main Street community. They had a Main Street charrette, um, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, um, like many of you, and then brought our team on board to help them kind of take that to the next level, especially focusing on uh, real estate and on retail. So I think it's important to kind of consider that whole progression. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about that, about Crystal Springs. Uh, Mayor Garland's gonna tell you about her approach, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then we're gonna quickly go through some retail trends, how COVID has affected retail, um, and some specific steps that you can implement to recruiting retail to your downtown. So now I'd love to ask Mayor Garland to come up. I'm gonna go through just a couple of these slides as she's coming up and then I'm just gonna turn it over to her. Um, you see up on the screen here some, some data pieces and we're gonna talk a lot more in detail about this in just a little bit. Um, but I think it's important to note that when we talk about retail, when we talk about business development, bringing those businesses that, you know, most Main Street programs dream of. If I just had that cute uh, ice cream shop on the corner, which we, we have now in Startville, um, but communities all over are wishing for a brewery, for that downtown ice cream shop, for these cool experiences, you have to really understand your community first beyond the municipal boundaries. So what you see up here, some of these data points don't represent you know, the city of Crystal Springs, their population's not 20,000, but the trade area is. So we're gonna talk more about that. Um, but you also see here on the bottom, these categories, these retail focus categories. So all of these things we're gonna break down in just a moment. Um, you can see here, this is a piece from the strategic plan we did for Crystal Springs, where we kind of uh, built on what they had. This is an example of a block um, kind of in their downtown and using paint colors that they had already identified through an architectural kind of review concept, um, we identified how that could really get these buildings ready for a tenant, for that restaurant, that business, that boutique that we're all really wishing for. And then finally, we talked about, you know, how to work with property owners. And that is what Mayor Garland's gonna talk to you guys about, kind of property owners and her dream for the next phase of downtown Crystal Springs. So whenever I became mayor, it, Crystal Springs was like a lot of small cities uh, across uh, Mississippi, uh, probably Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, other places. We had, uh, we were a, a shipping industry and we had several um, packing sheds and a depot and then urban renewal came through and decided you know they wanted some asphalt and you know asphalt tore down a lot of our historic things and and there was a lot of that to make parking places in a town 
our city inside the city limits is 5,000 people. So they, uh, they made this big, huge mall looking parking lot in our downtown. And we knew that, you know, that's not how, uh, that doesn't make a place, just like we, what you, uh, the Main Street people, have been talking about for so long. And, and I had come to an actual Main Street uh, presentation, and they talked about trees. And, you know, y'all probably seen that same presentation where people spend more money in places where that, that looks good, that looks desirable. So um, we needed to set that up, and we needed to figure out how. And we are, we do not have Walmart in Crystal Springs. Uh, we have a lot of uh, little small businesses that um, that support us. We don't have a large tax base, so we had to get creative on how we're going to do this. So Main Street, to join Main Street, and I know that some of y'all are fully into it, and you are directors and someone else start, maybe even started those, that Main Street, but it, the $10,000 or whatever it is now to join Main Street, Crystal Springs, did, we didn't have $10,000 to join Main Street. We needed to have, you know, money to pay the city clerk to keep the books. So one of the things we did was we sent out letters. So a local attorney who uh, loves Crystal Springs, his family's from there, just like, like uh, I do and several other people, just sent letters out to people and said, look, would you, we, it's going to cost us $10,000 to be a member of Main Street. Um, would you like to help? And people started sending in money. Uh, and individuals would send in 100 or $200, and a business would send in $500. And we, that's how we paid our first $10,000 for we, people just sending in the money to pay for Main Street. Uh, and then they did a charrette. And when they did that charrette, they came in and did the charrette. It was a three-day intensive time where we told them our story. And they came in, Jan's here, Randy's over there, the, some of the team is, is still here. They did the charrette and, you know, I'm a mayor and I think I'm really smart and I know a lot of things and I'm from Crystal Springs, eighth generation person, but I do not. I do not know what you know. And I do not know what those professionals know. So we have got to, as leaders and Main Street directors, ask for help from other people. Um, we have Trey from PPM back here, and this is another uh, av avenue that we had to, for the money. We had a Brownfields grant. He, he managed that. He, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to talk to you about that. But in the planning, uh, he was able to help us fund some of the retail strategies things and the plans. And then, I mean, I, I didn't know things like, um, they told me, the retail strategies people on the recruiting businesses and stuff, they were talking about a business that wanted to come to Crystal Springs and they were talking about, you know, and it's in the market, the Jackson Metro market. We're about 25 miles south of Jackson on I-55. And it was, I know this is, sounds crazy, but it was the way it was. And a lot of our people, our business owners didn't know this either, that we drive to Jackson all the time to buy a pair of shoes. Well, guess what? If you have a great pair of shoes in Crystal Springs, they'll drive from Jackson to Crystal Springs to buy that. It's the market. And they talked about that so nonchalantly, and I didn't know. I didn't know those kind of things. And we, we, we uh, developed a relationship. And Jen, I actually heard you speak at, at another thing. And she came down and spoke with us about the downtown. And, and, and she, they took a look at it, a professional look at our city and one of the things that they said was um, adapt or die and that's the choice we have uh, and I'm talking about us and uh, adapt or die and so it has developed into uh, why don't you take a look at this this will make you better uh, and then we have the people who live there who live in our towns and maybe somebody owns you may not have this in your city but we have it in ours you have this guy that owns this building that his mom and daddy left him and he didn't care about it at all he's uh, he's all about uh, uh, I ain't gonna sell it until I get exactly what I want for that and I don't care if it falls down to the ground well we what do you do about something like that well I am on a, there's never been a, more, a better opportunity, Main Street directors, 
than now to figure out how to remake your city. Whether you are a city that can afford it or if you're a city like Crystal Springs who can't afford something like that. And we were told at, um, as mayors and leaders of cities with the COVID funds that are coming to each city, and I actually sat in on a webinar from Retail Strategies on this, um, just put the money in an interest bearing account and hold it there. Let it sit there until all the rules come down to make sure that you're following the rules before you spend the money because if you, you know, if you spend the money before all the rules come down, you could, you know, you could have to pay it back. But from the National League of Cities who lobbied for these funds, do y'all know what I'm talking about? They're, they're coming straight, instead of them coming to your state, my, in Mississippi, going to the state and then coming to uh, us having to fight each other for, for all of us, each city was, you know, is given a certain amount of money. Now, I have a dream, There's, you can always use it on water and sewer upgrades, and we will, and I care about things that go under the ground because that's important. Um, but we have a dream. Now, I'm not saying you can do this. Do not quote me on this. This is my dream that I hope that maybe we can do it. And if we can't do it with these funds, maybe there's a way that we can convince people. And maybe we can even be used as a model, Jen. Maybe you can lead us on this. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we hopefully can use either these funds or some. Wouldn't it be wonderful to, Felicia knows this, she's heard this, she's our, our Main Street Director and our Parks and Recreation Director, go buy that building for what they want it for. They want $125,000 for that $50,000 building. So we go pay them $125,000. And then, guess what we gotta do right when we, right when we buy it? We gotta go put a roof on it. We gotta spend $50,000 to put a roof on that, on that building. And then we put new wiring and we make it safe and then we turn around and sell it to this guy that's a chef. He's always dreamed of being a chef and he's great. He's never been able to buy that building and fix it up and repair it and, and sell it to him for our lease purchase, let him lease purchase that building for a third of that. And what does it do for us? It revitalizes our city. It gives these people, and the, chan the reason for this, the reason the National League of Cities uh, lobbied for this money in the first place was to help the, per the, the people who were affected by COVID. Well, these people, these restaurants, uh, gyms, bars, these people were affected by COVID. So this is an opportunity, uh, if, we can, if we can get a yes out of it, we think we may can, to remake all of our small cities uh, because let's, you know, Crystal, uh, Mississippi is made up of small towns. Arkansas is probably the same way. Um, so the, I believe the future is bright. It's bright for Crystal Springs. And I would like to say one other thing, and I'm gonna turn it right back over to Jen. And I realize that a lot of the people in this room um, aren't the government. We were talking about how you go and you talk to the government. And I am the government, the government, so you have to go talk to the government. Um, at some point, hear me when I say this, and you go back and tell your government this, I can take it so far. I can, t I can beautify every street in town. I can hang lights and get this uh, Main Street to do this and that. At some point, we've got to turn it over to the people and let the people do the rest. So we, that is a part, uh, a component. So uh, without having to take up the whole time, I'm going to turn it back over to Jen and then just, you know, just talk whenever you want me to talk in Thank there. Thank you, okay. Mayor. You're exactly right. And I think um, a couple things. First, if you are not familiar with the American Rescue Plan, which is the funds that the mayor is talking about, um, let us know. We have a ton of resources where we have read the entire bill, broken it down. Um, but just as the mayor is saying, every city in America, every city, town, and village is getting a direct allocation of funds for the first time ever, probably for the last time in a long time. And that money can be used to 
uh, remedy the effects of COVID. And so, you know, we're going to talk in, actually right now through kind of some retail trends about, um, you know, what has COVID done? And in a lot of communities, I think it's really important that we note this, a lot of communities that we visit with say, well, my sales tax revenue is higher than it's ever been. So COVID has not affected our community. When you dig a little bit deeper, your online sales went through the roof and Mississippi can collect, and Louisiana and Arkansas can collect that sales tax revenue through online purchases, but your small business revenue declined probably 30 to 40% um, prior to, or compared to January, 2020. So who does that affect? That affects our downtowns, those small businesses. So I think it's really important that we first really analyze what the effects of COVID have been on our communities. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. And then as we're going through this, this discussion about retail and how to recruit retailers and what the future of retail is, um, adapt or die, like the mayor said, is really the theme. Um, retail has changed a lot. It's not dead, but it is changing. And we're gonna talk about how it has changed, but downtowns are the perfect place to really make that investment to recruit those entrepreneurs uh, those new businesses or help those existing businesses. Um, but it can't be the same way that it's always been. And so um, I'm so glad you gave that perspective, Mayor. Thank you. Um, and, and as you said, too, it's got to be a public-private partnership. You know, we need that public investment um, to help those property owners get their businesses ready for new tenants. Um, but ultimately, the city can't do everything. It has to be turned over to those private business owners, but we wanna give them the best start that they can. So just briefly, um, you've heard a little bit about our company, but Retail Strategies has several divisions. And my division uh, that we're here uh, talking about today is Downtown Strategies, where we work with um, cities, as you can see on this map, in 19 different states from coast to coast to really help them um, with a strategic vision for their communities. Um, we're a partner of Main Street America, America. Um, you know, I've been a Main Street director before, so we truly believe in that. Um, but we also know that sometimes cities need um, something a little bit more bite-sized than a 20-year master plan or than a super in-depth charrette. And so that's where we come in with five-year plans. And so a lot of what we're talking about today are things that you can start literally tomorrow and that you can start seeing results in one, two, three, five years. Um, so let's dig right into to retail. First, I'd love to know from you guys, you know, is business recruitment currently a focus of your program? If it is, will you raise your hand? Do you actively recruit businesses? So when I was a Main Street director, I knew what we needed, but I really didn't know what the steps were. You know, I tried to make relationships with our property owners. A lot of them were curmudgeons. They didn't really want to talk to us. Um, so how do you do it? You know, how do you recruit a business? Um, we're going to talk about that. First, let's just do kind of a, a little quiz to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page about the stats. First, what do you think the percentage of jobs are in America that are retail? You can just say A, B, or C. You can just shout it out, it's okay. So it's A, so one in four jobs in America are retail jobs. And so this is important because as Main Street directors, sometimes within our cities, you know, it's all about industrial recruitment. You know, let's, let's land that big fish and bring 300 jobs to the community. And that's really great and that's super important. But just these everyday retail jobs are a huge part of economies in rural communities, one in four jobs. So retail is important. Second, what percent of retail do you think is considered small business? Shout it out. It's actually C. So 98% of businesses in America are categorized as small businesses. And so while our company, part of our company, um, recruits national retailers to commercial corridors, that is important in communities. You know, we need that sales tax revenue, that tax base, even though sometimes Walmart might be portrayed as the devil, sometimes it's good because it brings a lot of money to our city coffers that can fund Main Street projects. But at the end of the day, what really makes your community who it is are those local businesses, that experience that people can get, not from the Walmart or the Chipotle, but from the Two Brothers Smoked Meats, or from the Humble Taco, or the local businesses. So this is why this is important, again, 
to the communities. Third, what do you think is the largest consumer demographic group? You can see at the bottom all the different demographics. Which one do you think is the largest in terms of numbers of people and the money they spend? Millennials. So I'm a millennial, Jan. So that's my that's why I bring this up because I'm on the top end of that demographic. I love you. But, you know, that millennial group, kind of no matter what our perception is, and I've even had that perception, um, but they're getting married, they're buying houses, they're having kids, they're settling down, and they represent the largest buying power in America. And so that doesn't mean that we have to only think about them, but it is important that we sort of think about what are their characteristics. And first and foremost, they crave an experience. You know, they'd rather go to a cool restaurant that's Instagrammable, that has a good vibe, rather than just getting something door dashed. They do love convenience, but they'll pay more money for an experience. And so what better place to offer that experience than a downtown? But again, adapt or die. It can't be the same Main Street that it was 20, 30 years ago. Those businesses that you have that are kind of your legacy businesses, they've got to adapt, right? What they're, the way they're doing things doesn't really jive with the way that millennials spend money and what their expectations are. And COVID has really been the great accelerator in that regard. Um, it has fast forwarded our dependency on technology. And if you think about it, it, people of older generations now understand technology because they had to. I mean, my grandmother's 90 and it used to be that she would call me to make her Amazon purchases. Now she orders her groceries online and picks them up, you know, at curbside pickup. So this is the future. Okay, this one I love because I'm, you know, it's always all over the place. What percent of retail sales do you think are online? And these figures are as of March of 2021. So these are rather current figures. So it's, I say only 15%. Um, that is a lot because uh, prior to the pandemic, it was you know, in 2019, it was 8%. In 2020, it was 13%. Now it's 15%. It's going to keep growing. Um, but, next question, what percent of consumers prefer to shop in store? 78%. So the point here is that it takes both. Um, it takes both. You've got to be able to offer that great experience downtown, but when you're thinking about the types of retailers, the spaces that they need, consumers are shopping differently. They're looking for different things. They want convenience. They expect convenient uh, experiences, um, but they really want to shop in your store if you make it easy for them, if you open when you say you're going to be open, you know, all of these things, and not all of you, of course, but but those businesses that I know that you can think of in your, in your communities. So just real quick, you know, they're really kind of through COVID, after the 2008 recession and through COVID, there was this notion in the national news of a retail apocalypse. You know, retail is dying, all these stores are closing, Toys R Us, you know, J. Crew. oh my gosh, you know, all these stores that we always thought would just be fine forever. These national stores were closing hundreds of locations. And so I guess that means that everything's going online and there's not a place for brick and mortar anymore. Well, that's not true. It's retail's not dying, it's changing. And so when we think about, you know, Sears used to be the retail, you know, kind of mecca. They had their catalog, all of these things. They did not adapt, you know, they didn't get online fast enough and Amazon came into play and now they're the king. That doesn't mean that retail's dying. People are spending more money on retail categorized items than they ever have ever in the history of retail, but they're doing it differently. You know, it used to be that you would go into a radio shack and buy all of those items on the right separately. You know, you'd have an alarm clock, you'd have your Garmin GPS, you'd have a landline, a camcorder, all these things. Now, every single one of those items can be found, you know, on your phone. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, radio shack had to die. It just means that they did not adapt, right? They 
Could they have made partnerships with some of these, you know, large technology companies maybe? Um, it, takes, it takes adaptation. It also takes innovation. And I think, you know, if we can think about, and these are national brands I know, but one thing that's really important to us at Downtown Strategies is that we look at what is winning in the national realm. What are the trends? What are these businesses that are literally making billions of dollars? What are they doing? And how can that be kind of uh, downsized and right-sized for a local retailer? Um, and, and that's re really where this comes from. So we know that you know Walmart had kind of played around with pickup and, and these curbside pickup pickup lanes. But of course, in the midst of COVID, we started seeing every single Walmart implementing this, this availability of grocery pickup, and we all became familiar with it. Similarly with Starbucks, you know, they had made that investment with their app, and I always hate apps because I don't want my phone filled with just a bunch of thousands of different apps, but now, you know, I've, through COVID, I got accustomed to, I need to leave the house and get away from my kids for uh, five minutes. Let me go do my little order on the app and go pick up my Starbucks. This is what people are now used to. And so these types of businesses that had made this investment pre-COVID, really we saw huge gains with them. But also think about the adaptations that you guys saw in your downtowns through COVID. You know, we saw these businesses banding together to figure it out in whatever way they could. But the businesses that already had an online presence, right, they were the ones that really have succeeded. I was in um, the Lexington, Kentucky area um, two days ago and talking to a small business owner there. And she said, you know, I had an online store set up before COVID. Um, didn't really pay attention to it because I didn't have that much time. But when COVID happened, I started treating it as a second store. And now what used to be 10% of her revenue now makes up 45% of her revenue. And so again, it's really time that we start thinking about retail a little differently. The mayor mentioned this, that you know, when she's able to fulfill her dream of buying those buildings, that one of the things that she's thinking about is kind of splicing up those 3,000, 5,000 square foot buildings into 1,500 square foot spaces. Um, for those of y'all that went on the tour in downtown Startville on Main Street, the Hotel Chester, um, if you guys saw that hotel on the corner, you know, that bottom floor used to be one big giant space. Um, it was never used, it was underutilized, and it's half a block of Main Street. Um, they broke it up into three or four different units. They're now making more money on tenant revenue than they ever have, and there's all this vitality for multiple different users. So one question that we get all the time when we visit with communities is, I've got this old JC Penney's, right? Or this old department store, this old hardware store. Um, you know, I need, th that's my catalyst project. I need to find this great business that's gonna need 5,000 square feet. Probably not gonna happen, you know? Maybe for a restaurant, but they need all kinds of equipment. So the best bet is to rethink that space. And that's really what this slide is portraying is that as a country in America, we're way over retailed in terms of square footage. Um, you know, really kind of in the 90s when there was this mega mall, you know, approach. Um, and we started seeing big box everything in malls and lifestyle centers. Compared to other like countries, we don't need that much space. Do we still need places to shop? Yes. but. Today, think about your retailers, what they need, and we've seen this happen in Startville and, and clients of ours all over, is that a business might need, say they have a 3,000 square foot building or a 5,000 square foot, if it's a, a clothing store, they might only need 1,500 square feet or 1,000 square feet of that main street frontage, and then they can put up a demising wall and the whole back of house is their distribution center for their online orders. Right, so just rethinking that footprint. They can't afford to buy merchandise for 3,000 square feet. That's generally their biggest problem and they, they fail in the first few years. These are the eight steps to recruiting retail and restaurants and we're gonna go through each one. Um, the first is to form your team. And I think this is so important. 
So when I was the CEO of the Greater Sharpeville Development Partnership here, um, and a couple board members in here that have been part of this conversation with me all those years ago was, whose job is it? Right? Like, I mean, yeah, we know that we have vacancies and we need to fill them, but whose job is it? You know, is it the economic developer's job? Is it the mayor's job? Is it the real estate, you know, broker's job, the commercial real estate broker's? Like, I don't want to step on toes. It's your job. And that's just, that's how I feel. And, and that's how I think we felt in Startville um, at that time was, you know what? We know what's going on in downtown Startville. We might not know all the incentives, we might not know all of the jargon about real estate transactions, but we know what's going on downtown, we know the people, and we know what we need. So all that to say, I would really implore you to just take it on, but you've got to have a team. And so who, who needs to be on this team? You know, it's people that will help get these deals across the finish line. If there is a real estate, a commercial real estate person in your community, have them on the team. That's great. Your mayor, your community development director, the economic developer, whoever it is, um, a property owner that owns half of downtown if he or she is nice. A lot of times that person is like a villain. Um, but these are people that can share information um, and can help you, you know, really get these, these deals across the finish line. Um, then you've got to develop a common purpose. Like, what is the purpose? Are you trying to fill vacancies? Well, in Startville, we didn't have a ton of vacancies. Like, we were very fortunate once we started really rocking and rolling. But what we did need to know was who is about to have a vacancy? You know, is this business going to be closing? Well, if so, we need to be ahead of it so that the lawyer, who are wonderful folks, but they don't need to be on Main Street. They need to be on the side streets or on the second floor. And so the best way to do that is to bring a property owner a tenant and say, hey, I know that this is about to close. I've got a gift shop that's ready to go whenever they you know, turn in their notice. Because a property owner needs to make money, right? I mean, they're going to most of the time take whatever kind of lease they can get. So this is a, another, you know, reason that it's important to really develop to to develop a common purpose, um, so that everybody's on the same page. And then three is draft a work plan, and this is something that um, can be a little bit different for every community. But what is the process? You know, develop your process. If somebody comes to your office, they used to come to mine all the time and say tell me what's going on in Startville. And I could spot a developer a mile away. You know, they were just kind of testing the water. Um, but I really at that time thought, God, if I only had like a, just a flyer to give them that had all the demographics, that had our key focus properties, there are people that can help you do that. We can help you do that, but other people can help you do that too. So that's a thing. So again, that work plan really outlines what is the process. If you get a lead, if you have a vacancy, what are the steps and who does what? Next, and this we could talk for hours about this, but um, it is to create a business-friendly environment. Now, that means a lot of different things, and I'll tell you what it means to me, but, and everybody might have their own kind of um, thoughts on this. You know, number one, the district needs to look good. You know, I mean, it needs to be an inviting place. Hey, Matt Tate. <laughs> um, to, you know, it needs to be an inviting place that somebody's going to want to invest. Something that it, you know, it really kind of frustrates me, to be honest, is that whenever we meet with, uh, you know, sometimes when we meet with communities, we start talking to stakeholders or citizens, not directors like you guys, but just Joe Citizen, and they're like, you know, we need blank, 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 you know, almost like we need these entrepreneurs to do us a favor, to come serve us. I mean, when people open a business, they're generally putting everything on the line. You know what I mean? They have to be able to make money. So the best way to encourage someone to come invest their money in your community and in your downtown is for your downtown to look awesome, you know, and for there to be vitality. And so we always get this question like chicken or the egg, what comes first? Is it that you have these great businesses and that's what brings all the people? Well, we kind of believe at retail strategies that retail follows people. 
you know, it's not, it is the opposite too, but retail follows people. When you think about these national retailers, they follow rooftops, right? They want to be near the neighborhoods because those are their customers. For Main Street businesses, it's the same thing. When someone is considering, am I going to invest my money in, you know, I don't know, I'm drawing a blank, Moundville, Alabama, or um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or Northport, you know, they're going to drive through, and wherever they see people dining outside, walking their dogs, you know, um, public art, lighting, they're like, oh yeah, that's where I want to be. So I say all that to say that the placemaking techniques that you've heard so much about today and, and will tomorrow as well, those are so important. And often, you know, I believe those come first because you can have a main street full of people with no businesses. I mean, I've seen it, you know, where people want to exercise there. They want to, um, if there's a public space, they want to have their lunch out there or let their kids play or go to a festival or whatever. So that's first is really invest. And it's never going to be perfect, of course. Um, but investing in the place, I think, comes first. Then you've got to consider the business environment next. Um, what are the barriers to investment? You know, if somebody is going to open up a new business, why wouldn't they? Is it because property prices are too high, the buildings are in poor condition, or my favorite, the city's not business friendly, you know? Well, what does that really mean? And so I think the role of a downtown organization and a Main Street director too, and, and your whole program, is to figure out what are your standards? You know, because there are communities that we visit that's, that think that any type of restriction is bad. You know, we do not want anyone telling us what to do with our properties, with our signage, with our, like, mm -mm, don't tell us that. But if you want to create a place that is inviting, that looks good, that people want to be, generally you need to have some sort of a standard. So some signage guidelines, some facade color options so that we don't have pink, purple, lime green. That can be fine sometimes, but you know what I mean. Um, so when we say business friendly, we don't mean throw out all restrictions. Like, no, that's not what we mean. Develop some reasonable restrictions that will protect the investment, you know, of the people that you're courting and then make sure that the processes are clear. Yes, Trey. So one thing that I've had as well as come to me and they say when they come to a city or a town to try to coordinate that with your city council meeting. And if your city council meeting is not orderly and you're not and you're having battles, they're probably gonna be pissed at some point. So Yeah. That's a great point. Gosh, it brings to mind a council meeting I was at where the council fired the mayor at the meeting. That happened. So yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. Yes, and, and rarely do we know when people are visiting. You know, I think that's the other important piece is that, you know, when, when someone's thinking about bringing that brewery or that whatever business, they're not going to call and say, hey, Jen, I'm coming to tour. Will you show me around? No, they just come and see for themselves, you know, or, or groups like us tour them around and don't tell anyone. So it, it's real, those things are super important, Trey. Um, and then, you know, the last point is to think about incentives. This is something through our strategic planning efforts that we focus on heavily. And I think, you know, it's really kind of unknown, unchartered waters for a lot of downtowns. Um, we always hear about TIFs, you know, tax increment financing for industrial projects or for big, big box retail development, strip centers. But we don't always hear about that for downtown. Well, why not? You know, I mean, so really I would consider or encourage you guys to consider working with your city officials on incentives. Um, every project does not deserve an incentive for sure, you know, but certain ones, if you've got an old hotel that, you know, needs to be 
uh, or that somebody wants to turn into condos, they're just not going to do it without public incentives. You know, it, they can't make the numbers work. Similarly, in rural communities where incentives can really make a big difference, is that when you think about it, you know, we well, can't somebody just buy this building and fix it up and, and rent it out? Well, the numbers have to work, you know, there's a pro forma and that has to end up in the black and not the red. And so often the buildings have been neglected for so long that there's no way to make that number black without public investment or public incentive. And so I would encourage y'all to think about your buildings, you know, um, you know the ones that have been sitting there, they're leaking, like mayor said, a roof, 50,000 minimum, you know. Can the city acquire these buildings through receivership, through a tax deductible donation, through code enforcement, um, through purchasing them? and stabilize them, put a roof on, seal it up, and then offer that as an incentive. Say, like, hey, developer, I will give you this build, excuse me, this building, if you do X, Y, Z, if you create this number of jobs, if you bring these types of focus category businesses, you know what, they did that with this building right here. I mean, they didn't give it away, but they put out an RFP and they said, developers in the world, what would you do with this building? Here are our requirements. We're not gonna make you pay for the building. You know, that's really how you get big deals done. And so we can help you with that through navigating those incentives. Um, but these are the things that are really required before you go out and start figuring out what types of businesses you want or need. You gotta have the behind the house ducks in order first. Please don't let me break this. <laughs> okay. Um, number three is to understand your market. This is also something that I feel like is not talked about hardly at all in the Main Street world, and that's okay. I mean, I didn't even really think about it before I uh, came on board with retail strategies. But when we talk about adapt or die, when we talk about retail is changing, we talk about businesses have to make money. Um, we have to understand the true economic conditions of our community beyond just what we feel. You know, like, hey, I work on Main Street, I know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. You do, but from an economic perspective, you know, that's really what matters. And so, you see these questions on the left. Who are your existing customers? Like, beyond a zip code survey, like from cell phone data, who are your customers? And so this is this is kind of the future of, of data. It's these, you know, with this new little iPhone update, I feel like every time I open an app, it's, will you allow me to track you? And I'm always like, yes, because my company buys this data. But that is what allows companies like us and larger retailers to know who the true consumers are in an area. And I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a second. Um, so who are your, cons your customers? Um, what are their patterns in terms of categorical expenses? You know, we might think that we can support an upscale gourmet grocery store, but does the data support that? If it doesn't, too bad, you know, not happening. But wouldn't you rather know? Wouldn't you wanna know what your opportunities are? And so that's really where the data can help. And most importantly, what categories of businesses are you missing that you could realistically support in your downtown? That's like the magic question, and we can help you with that. Um, so we, we put together something, a retail focus category report. So we will do that, you know, happily complimentary for any of you guys. If you just drop off your card or give me your email address, we'll run that based on your, your community, your downtown, and we'll identify what your focus categories are. And, and what we, we'll look at that in a second, but basically it means that people are spending money on those items outside of your community, right? That's kind of your leakage. So the steps here are to identify the trade area. You know, you remember when we opened up this presentation, um, we showed a trade area for Crystal Springs of about 20,000 people. And Mayor said, our population's 5,000. But 
people from way outside of those municipal boundaries are coming to Crystal Springs. That's great. So you're doing yourself a disservice if you only think about your municipal demographics because that does not matter. You know, it's almost always way larger than that. So here's an example of a customized trade area. So what we do is, again, we measure the cell phone activity in and out of a geofenced area. So a lot of times we'll look at a Walmart or a Dollar General because we don't want to know who's coming for tourism purposes. You know, we don't want to know who's coming to ball games here or who's going to the trails in Hattiesburg or whatever. You know, we want to know who's coming for paper towels uh, you know, bananas, apples, things like that. So we'll, we'll measure that and you can see that in this example, I think this is Magnolia, Arkansas, um, you can see that on this heat map it shows who is visiting this community and where they live and so we can kind of draw um, a line around that to determine that customized trade area. Uh, then we start to pull the demographics from that to figure out, you know, what categories of businesses are you missing. Um, here's something else that's part of that retail focus category report that we'll be glad to do for you guys, and it's just a walkability assessment um, because this is also super important to retailers in a downtown. You know, they, we talked about that vitality. Retail follows people. So within a tra or within a 20 minute walk time, um, let's see what community this is. Um, you can see that these colored kind of bubbles represent a five here in the green a 10 in the orange and a 20 minute in the gray walk time from the center of that downtown. So why is this useful? Well, first of all, we can see in this infographic down here that in a 20 minute walk time, there are 15,000, 14,000 people that live within 20 minutes of this downtown. So wouldn't a retailer like to know that? That in addition to all of the people that can just drive and park, that we have a 15,000 person walkable trade area. That's pretty good. Um, also, we want to look and see within that trade area, or excuse me, that walkable distance, that 20 minute walkable distance, what other assets are there? You know, is there a park? And when we think about that park, we think, oh, that's so far from downtown, but it's only a 10 minute walk. Well, maybe we want to think about putting a sidewalk from that park to downtown to funnel those people in. You know, we work in a lot of college towns. When I was in Kentucky the other day, um, was in Richmond, Kentucky, which is um, the home of Eastern Kentucky University. And their um, college is literally a five minute walk from downtown, but there isn't a dedicated pathway and there's 15,000 students there. So it's things like that. That's what we pull from these walkability assessments. So we'll be glad to do one of those for you. And then also commute patterns. You know, this is really important too because how many times do you have businesses on Main Street that close at five, you know? Well, like people work. <laughs> and so when we look at this travel time to work in this community, we've measured a three mile radius around the downtown. So within that three mile radius, there are 24,000 people of working age that live in that area. 77% of them drive alone to work. Um, we have, um, and then we, we look at the travel time to work. So, you know, we see that majority of the people are driving between five and 20 minutes to work every day. So they're not shopping with you, you know, if you close at five. So this is also really helpful so that these businesses, when they're opening, can determine what hours are best. Um, does your daytime population grow or does it shrink? These are all things that, that can really be defined by the data and that businesses want to see. All right, what time is it? Um, step four, inventory your real estate. So one of Main Street's you know, requirements or strong suggestions is to do a building and business inventory. Um, and I, I, you know, I used to think, well, that's great, you know, but that's just gonna take me so long. <laughs> Probably not gonna do that, you know. Um, <laughs> but it, I regret that because it's very, very important. Um, and really here's why. So often I, I think that Main Street directors and all of us think, you know, if I could just get that magic business, but we don't think where is that business gonna go? You can't have a conversation with a prospect to say, oh, we need you in downtown Startville or downtown, you know, 
X, Y, Z if you don't have an available piece of real estate to show them. It's just like saying, wouldn't you like to buy a house in Birmingham? Uh, but we have no houses, <laughs> you know, you, it's just kind of dumb. So you really want to be able to inventory all of that real estate, understand what's available, and then be the matchmaker. You know, what we're not saying is that you need to be a real estate agent because you don't, and you can kind of get in trouble for that, but you can be a matchmaker for sure. And that's really the role here. So here's an example. I know it's really hard to see, but I'll tell you some of the important things. Um, we can run these uh, for our client communities. We just kind of click a button and it populates. And I think, oh, I wish I would have known that back then. But it tells you within a given area, you know, every single piece of property, who owns it, the square footage, what year it was built, um, if it's in an opportunity zone, which eh, those are kind of difficult, so that, you know, but it's good to know, um, what it's generating in taxes or what the current tax rate is, and then you would go in and put in a column for the tenant, you know, list, who's renting that space? If you know, I mean, I know, you guys know everything about what's going on in your downtown. You know what properties rent for, probably. I mean, I used to kind of know about what, what things rented for. So add that as a column. And then if something is vacant, highlight it red. If it's at risk, if you think there's no way that business survives another month, highlight it yellow. Keep track of it. That's kind of your, your real estate book, if you will. And that way you can promote actual pieces of property. Um, when we think about real estate, there's three types of retail real estate. There's, you know, redevelopment or adaptive reuse, which, you know, we all know about. That's kind of that catalyst project, that hotel, that could be condos or whatever. There's land for new development, and then there's existing vacant space. So it's important that you kind of think about this differently because different users are going to want different things. And then there's this, the four Ds of real estate. <laughs> and you know, there's a lot of this happening right now, unfortunately. Do not mean to make light of that. But when we think about it, these four Ds of real estate are generally, if one of these happens, it's what makes a property shift. Can you think of, of a property in your community that you think, it's almost like waiting on a funeral, or gosh, if that person would just sell this or give it to their son or whatever it is. You know, I, I had my list for sure. Um, well, I don't mean, you know, any about COVID or anything like that, but, you know, there are, things are happening. People are reevaluating their portfolios. People are thinking, okay, the economy's a little, un you know, unsure right now, might be the time to sell. So bring this up to say, it's more important than ever that you have an understanding of the real estate in your community. Because if you can play a part in getting that property in the hands of someone that will do something good with it, rather than just another this or another that, like that's huge. So be mindful of that. All right, number five is to assemble recruitment and marketing materials. Um, this is for um, a client of ours, Zachary, Louisiana, that's right outside of Baton Rouge. Um, we've worked with them as long as Downtown Strategies has existed, and this is something that they use every single day, literally. Um, you know, the mayor's really active in promoting um, his downtown in available space, and this is what developers and entrepreneurs are looking for. First of all, they want to know that trade area, you know, just like we were talking to you guys about. Um, they want to know some kind of basic demographics in a 5, 10, 20 minute drive time. That's, you know, we measure that custom trade area, but drive times are another measurement that retailers look at. Um, what are the demographics of that trade area? You can see. And then what's the daytime population? What's the percentage of that daytime population? Is it homemakers? Is it retirees? Is it students? Um, and then, most importantly, the focus categories. And this is what I was telling you guys we will create for you guys, but you can see, or maybe you can't, um, that their focus categories are restaurant, clothing, home furnishings, and entertainment places, <laughs> which is like breweries, bars, stuff like that. Um, so these are the important things to include on a flyer and then contact information for sure. If you have focused properties, if the city owns a, a piece of property, you know, certainly list that on here as well. 
All right, step six, and I promise we're almost done, is to identify prospects. So once you know what available real estate you have, and you know what categories of businesses you're missing, then you start to think about, okay, who are those businesses? Um, and that can come from a variety of different places. Um, so first, retail focused categories are imperative. Then you gotta think about your prospects. Who, where can they come from? So number one, um, an existing business within or near the business district. So maybe this is business expansion. You know, this is, um, uh, Deep South Powd, and they're doing all this business, and they need to double the size of their store. Okay, help them find a new spot. That's one. Two is emerging entrepreneurs. Think about your farmers markets. You know, here in Startville, we had two businesses that were born out of the farmers market that moved into brick and mortar stores that were like awesome, very popular location. So think about how you can really nurture entrepreneurs at your farmer's markets, at your holiday festivals, um, help them build a following and then help them find a space in your, in your downtown. Third is existing local or regional businesses. And I feel like this is something that people kind of don't think about a lot, but if there's a community next to you that might be a little bit bigger that has this great business, just go talk to them. Hey, have y'all ever thought about expanding to, you know, central Louisiana? Uh, we've got a great space. I'd love to show it to you sometime. It's just as simple as that. And then fourth, this is really up to you in your own community, but national chains. You know, brands like Insomnia Cookies, um, Orange Theory Fitness, they like to be in downtowns. They like to be in college towns. So, um, so if that's right for your community. So start thinking about who those businesses are and then reach out to them. You also kind of want to think about your ideal tenant mix. And one of the categories on your property inventory will show the asset type. So you don't want all municipal. Like you do need some municipal, but you don't want all of your good property to be owned by the city or the county. You also don't want it to all be service industry. You don't want lawyers and accountants um, taking up your good Main Street frontage. You need retail and restaurant. You need a little mix of both. And we get this question a lot, but no, there is no perfect mix. Like there is no true formula, um, but you just need a little bit of everything. So think about that. And then once you've identified those prospects, you make outreach to them. And Email is a great way to do it, popping in their store if they're an existing business, um, hosting the prospect in your community. I have hosted a number of retail prospects from you know, Birmingham that I really wanted to have here in Startville, and they love it. You know, Give them the royal treatment, but you have to keep in mind confidentiality. And a really good deal was blown in this very community because someone blabbed. So that's so important to, to keep that in mind. Um, and then number four is follow up. Like they're busy, you know, they're not going to remember this. So you've got to stay on top of, on top of that. We do have kind of a sample outreach email that whenever you guys get this presentation, but basically I've highlighted um, kind of some of the key things. This is for an adaptive reuse, but basically identify the property, like the name of the building, the address, where is it, what city is it in, how many square feet, who the current tenants are if it's a mixed use building or who the neighboring tenants are that are good, you know. Um, list any incentives. Hey, this is in a historic district. It's eligible for 25% historic tax credit and a 20% federal tax credit. Um, the city's willing to look at incentives if the project is in line with our economic development goals. Cool, like I'll be interested in looking at that and then give your info. And then step eight is to close the deal and share your success. So, you know, this is where really the, the, the job kind of begins all over again. You know, so once that deal is closed, celebrate it, you know, have your ribbon cutting, um, and, and share that success because success breeds success. So once you land something good and they start doing well, then share that, that news to other prospects and they're gonna wanna be part of it as well. Um, and remember that that's really when it starts all over again. So what's next? Re uh, reminder that we'll be happy to do your retail focus categories for you. I've got a notebook over here that I'll open up and y'all can just give me your card or write down your email address and we'll get that going for you guys. And then um, happy to answer any questions that you guys have.
for me or Mayor Garland. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to show you one thing just to give you a, I don't know if you can see that. That was like, anybody ever seen something like that? That's what our downtown looked like before, you know, because they wanted all that parking. Y'all see what kind of parking we had, right? And y'all are Main Street people, so I'll get it. But uh, and that is it now. So we did that, and we did that along with Main Street, but... Um, the citizens and, and the government can only do so much. So uh, I think with all, I think there's opportunities. I don't think we've ever had an opportunity so great and wonderful. And people are loving small town. They are. They're migrating towards small town. They are. Thank you so much. Thank y'all.